Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Now Israel and Raleigh Close series of Shirem. The Shirem tonight are dedicated to Nishmas Chaya Zelda Bas Menachem Mendel, Jenny Z. Gilbert, Zichrona Levraha, grandmother of Alison Cohen, whose yard site was the 21st of Tammuz. We are delighted we have three speakers from La Hava tonight. La Hava is a group based in Israel, providing opportunities for Torah learning for, for post-SEM women, run by young women in the community and overseen by Rabbi and Robertson Zobin. We're really pleased that Michaela Mann, Tamara Ezekiel and Ayelet Beso Cowan are speaking on what does Hashem want from us? The free fu three fundamentals, focusing on three ideas from a posok in Micha that God asks of us to do justice, love chesed and walk humbly. So first of all, we have Michaela Mann speaking on Ahavas Chesed, Building Our Eternity. Michaela is currently working as a madricha in Sem in Israel in Shalvim, although she's just come back to London. That's what she's been doing. And that's where she went to Sem herself. She's finishing this summer, the final year of her biomedical sciences degree at King's College London online. She's hoping to can continue as a madricha for the coming year at Shalvim, teaching Torah classes while studying for a master's program in psychology in Israel. I hand over to you now, Michaela, and thank you very much. Hi, everybody. Shalom to us all. Say thank you so much to everyone. It really is a huge opportunity for us to be able to share words of Torah on such an amazing platform. So really thank you to everyone who organized it and everyone who has been very much appreciated. Uh, if it's okay with everyone, I'm going to share a, my screen so that you can see the sources as I'm going through it. Is everyone able to see my screen? Yeah. Okay. Um, so I don't think I'm going to be able to go to all of it in person, but I just wanted to have all the sources there so that everything's over there. And if anybody wants it afterwards, I can either get the short email there or try to get it to you somehow. But um, I have an amazing opportunity to speak about the Mida of Chazad and what Chazad actually means. And when I was first thinking about what I should talk about, which type of things I should bring up, I was kind of stumped that I realized that I know a lot about chesed, you know, a lot of examples about chesed, and we just took a little chesed. Um, so I think of all these examples, and again, all the archetypes of chesed, and all the amazing people in Tanakh who were very chesed-oriented characters, when it came to understanding what the media actually is, and what we are actually here to do, um, I realized I actually don't know as much as I thought about the media of chesed itself. And the principle of chesed seems so obvious that we almost overlook the depth of the concept. And it's like that I try clarifying. And it's often easiest to understand a midah through its expression and external environment or the way that it's presented itself or the things that we do that associate with the chesed. But in the few minutes that we have, I'd love to look at the essential nature of, nature of what chesed is. Not as the act which emanates from it, the view of chesed, loving kindness, <laughs> and ahavas chesed at its core. So start off in source one, as you can see over here, there's a famous Gemara which talks about a man who came before Hill and he asked him, teach me all of Torah whilst you're standing on one leg. And Hill agreed and he responded, that which is hateful to you, don't do to another person. This is the entirety of Torah and the rest is its interpretation. Go study. Now on a simple level, the entirety of Torah was summarized on this principle of the to love another person as you love yourself. Which is is often synonymous with the Midah of Chesed, which is very interesting since the word Chesed isn't actually found here, which is something hopefully that we'll come back to. So the Pasuk says in source number two, I'm just going to scroll down to it, and he says, Olam Kiyamarti, Olam Chesed Yabana, and I've said that the world is created and built on Chesed. Shemaim, oh, let me turn this to the side so I can see the source. So the Pasuk states, Olam Chesed Yabana, the world is built on Chesed. And the Nativ of Shalom explains underneath in source three. This passage means that Hashem Dafka chose the Mida of Chesed to be the Mida through which the world was built and established. And he says, It was the desire of HaKadosh Baruch Hu to choose the Mida of Chesed, to build everything that the establishment and the building in this world, the seder who lades habroim and procreation, asa HaKadosh Baruch Hu, HaKadosh Baruch Hu created, shiyehei al yadei midas ha'ava v'chesed, that it should be on the midah of chesed and ava, that at each stage of life, you're basically 
progressing in the class of children where we are responsible only for ourselves and we are somewhat selfish to teenagers where we have more responsibility to spouses where we have to care about our husbands or wives and then eventually to parents where we have kids to look after and at each stage of development Kaddish Baruch has made it that we are forced to expand our sphere of self to be able to include a wider range of people to whom we have to give. It was the Ratzon of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. HaKadosh Baruch Hu wanted it to be the Midah of Chesed, through which the world is continued and built upon. So why specifically Chesed is it that HaKadosh Baruch Hu desires from us? And what about this Midah is so essential to the purpose in this world and to our lives as Torah Jews? So the Pasuk in Devarim states, which I will add over here, and it says, that after HaKadosh Baruch Hu, we should follow. And there is a halach of the halach de bidracha, that we should follow in HaKadosh Baruch Hu's footsteps. And the Mishrashim expects to mean that we should emulate HaKadosh Baruch Hu, as the Ebn Ezra over here in five states. And there's a really interesting lashon here, which is why I chose to use this specific source. That you shall do your utmost to imitate God's deeds and to chase after his paths according to your ability. And the Gemara in Sota develops this over here. We're not going to go into it because it's a very long Gemara, but it develops this question, basically explains that this Pasuk refers to emulating the Midos of Hashem with special attention to the Midos of Chesed. And he goes through all the different Midos of Chesed. Just in verse. And the Gemara continues over here. And he says that the entirety of Torah is enveloped in Chesed. And it says, that the start of Torah starts with Chesed, where HaKadosh Baruch Hu clothed Adam and Chava, and Torah ends with Chesed as well. And the Sefer Aravas Chesed, which is a Sefer that was written by the Chavetz Chaim, and he writes about this concept, and he says that the whole of Torah, not only was the start and the end of Torah, continued, in, enveloped in chesed, but the entirety of Torah is filled with chesed, and the main midah through which that we actually interact with HaKadosh Baruch Hu on is the midah of chesed. So why is Hashem Chavetz chesed? We still haven't answered that question. Why does HaKadosh Baruch Hu desire chesed so much from us? So Hashem desires a closeness to us and a relationship, and this is one of the main purposes of Torah, as it states in the Hakdam of Mesir Sisharim, and I didn't have time to put it in. But Mesir Sisharim talks about how the main thing that we are here to do and what we do, we fill our time with Torah and mitzvahs and we are always really being osek and trying to fulfill so many different mitzvahs throughout our day and it really takes up so much of our time. But in reality, like that's the first step. We're trying to do mitzvahs with the right intentions and with the right purpose, but there's a goal there. And the goal of doing mitzvahs and keeping Torah and mitzvahs is actually to attain a level of shemus and completion ourselves that will allow us to develop a level of dvikas, a connection with the Kaddish Baruch Hu, and a relationship with him and a closeness with him that eventually leads to the ultimate simcha, that leads to the ultimate happiness and osher, which is like a certain just like calm, knowing that we are close and one with HaKadosh Baruch Hu. So HaKadosh Baruch Hu desires closeness to us. And there's a beautiful concept that's expressed by Ali Shar, Rav Walpi, in his Sefer. And he states that mankind is called Adam in Torah. It's two extremities it can be. One side is that Adam comes from Adama. No Tzarama Adama, he's created from the ground and he is finite and isn't all powerful, all knowing. We're finally we come from the ground. But on the other side, we also have a holy faculty that's been bestowed to us. And we have an Ashama, which enables us to grow and attain incredibly lofty heights and to follow in Hashem's ways and to be what's called Adam el Elyon, to emulate our Kaddish Baruch Hu. So Rav Dezer and Vichtam explains this, and we'll come to it a little bit later. He explains how every decision in life is either one of taking or one of giving. And so whilst it is a mitzvah and it is a midah, but the entirety of life is either taking or giving. And when we consciously choose to give, we are emulating Hashem and being Makayim, the idea of being Adam El Elyon, being similar to Kaddish Baruch Hu, and that's the side of Adam that we're trying to elevate and work on. So this ultimately leads to Advikas, a closeness to Hashem, which is one of our main purposes here, as the Messiah Sharon said before. So as we understand that the root of the mitzvah, right, the root of the mitzvah is Ba'alach Tzidrachat, to follow in the Kaddish Baruch Hu's ways, to be close to Hashem. And one of the main ways that we could do that is through the Midah of Chesed, because that's the main way that we see Hashem. Why is it so valuable to Hashem that we should, and we know why it's so valuable to Hashem, sorry, that we should have chesed, because HaKadosh Baruch Hu wants the relationship with us and wants to be close with us, but we still haven't answered what actually is chesed and how do we attain that. So interestingly, in this Gemara that we see over here in Gemara 7, 
I'm not sure if anyone had like this thought, but when I was going through the Gemara, it was very interesting that it chose this chesed that HaKadosh Baruch Hu clothed Adam and Chava to be the first chesed. So I was looking around and trying to find an answer and I found something really beautiful that was in a safer, um by Rabbi Yaakov Heber. And he said that it was dafka in the time, there were so many other chesed's that we see prior to this. HaKadosh Baruch Hu created the world, he gave us clothes, like he gave us food, he made the environment beautiful, he gave Adam a spouse, like there are so many other chesed's that could have been chosen as the first chesed, but the Gemara dafka chooses this as the first chesed because he says it was dafka in this timing. HaKadosh Baruch Hu clothed Adam and Chava once they had sinned, once according to strict justice, he no longer needed to give to them and help them. But that was dafka what it meant to give, to be chesed oriented. And it was Dafka once, like, HaKadosh Baruch Hu chose to go beyond what justice dictates and beyond what was deserving for Adam and Chava to give. And that's what true chesed is. And so too, we see this in the Midah of Avraham, you know, when he goes and davens for Sodom, they weren't worthy of being saved. And yet he goes beyond what justice dictates to be able to give and to be able to ask for their salvation. And it wasn't that Avraham Avinu gave in the areas that he didn't have to give, right? He gave in the area he had, and he was overflowing with the desire to help and to emulate HaKadosh Baruch Hu, that he asked to be able to save the dorm, and he went out of his way to look for opportunities to be machnis orchim. And all these things are really incredible, not because of the acts themselves, but because of the intention behind it, and because he wanted to give up himself and go beyond what just did it in emulating HaKadosh Baruch Hu. So as we see from here, true chesed entails going beyond the letter of the law and going beyond what HaKadosh Baruch Hu requires us and it talks about it over here in the passage below um, in Abbas Chesed and it says that like Zeshemonea, like someone who really fulfills Chesed is Zeshemonea atzmo lehetev lereehu bli shum siba ma'achavetu mitza true Chesed, someone who really is a Baal Chesed is someone who is able to go and help someone without any reason or bias restricting him he gives because he has the desire and ability to and well kind of clarify what that means specifically soon. But whilst you could understand the importance of chesed, we want to try and understand exactly like how that works with the concept of justice. So we know that we're meant to be people who are yashar and who are amistic and who are who are straight people and, and there are a lot of rules around and how is it that we're meant to, we're expected to go beyond what justice dictates in order to be able to be chesed oriented people. And there's an Ali Shar piece over here that I found really, really beautiful. And he writes, what would our life be without dinim? We need justice. And he brings a quote from Father Mitzi, I think. And he says that the Yerushalayim was not destroyed because we weren't necessarily keeping to the Shurat Adin, keeping to straight justice. We did. We were very good at keeping to Alacha and keeping to the Din. But Yerushalayim was destroyed because we didn't go beyond the letter of the there is a space between the letters and we weren't able to take the next step to be pursuing Ava between Ben Adam and Chavira and we were amazing with the Halakha and but that's not it there's more to life than and there's more to Torah than the dicta Kalach and the detail itself the Shiras Adin who Gedar Shachinu Shiras Adin keeping to the Halakha itself is extremely important it's the boundaries of our life but the life itself is going beyond what justice dictates. We can't just keep life off direct, absolute truth. Going beyond what justice dictates is the middles of chesed and ava. And especially the generation like this, it's a possibility when it's an amazing opportunity for us to be able to take out this from potential and make it something that we actively pursue in our lives. So from here, we can see that it's an extremely important meal to balance both. Din is important. Being detail-oriented and caring about the halakha itself is extremely important. But at the same time, um, oh, one second, I just saw a message. Is everyone able to see the um, source sheet? I'm happy to share it if that's helpful with someone else. I'm happy to continue if not. But if anyone has any issues with seeing it, I'm happy to share it in a different platform. But whilst din is extremely important, keeping to the shuras are din, being justice oriented is extremely important, even that has its limits and it's confined. And we have to also be able to do chesed and to be able to oriented to. Oh, okay, right. So I'm going to email the uh, source sheet if that's okay. So it's going to delay. Um, do you know how I can do that? 
Sorry, it was Ayala who asked me if I could share her source sheet. So don't worry Hello. about it. Okay. Amazing. Perfect. Yeah. If anyone has an issue, I'm happy to share it, but that sounds good. Okay, so there was a video idea that I want to add from Ron Manuel Bags on this same topic. And he says how the first piece of the image that was destroyed because of like the Dikta Kalacha, but Israel at the time weren't keeping to the Dikta Kalacha, but they had great art and they had great Binadam Khaviro and they were very close to one another. And there was a love for Torah, but there wasn't strict justice and they weren't able to keep to the Dikta Kalacha, to the details and the mitzvahs. And that was an issue. And the base on the was the strength of base on the Dash. as Chavira. And the people of that time had a steadfast commitment to, to law, to halacha, but at the expense of love and kindness amongst each other. And to that generation, the Beislam Mikdash didn't re um, return. And there's a Gemara in Yavavos that talks about it. He says that, like, I think it's actually a Gemara in Yoma. Yeah. Um, and he talks about it, and he says that the generation of the second Beislam Mikdash, they weren't Zohar to see the Beislam Mikdash return, because the effects of the Benadam, the lack of Benadam Chavira, the lack of Chesed, the lack of Ava between us, between people, was okay, so we're still in a state of missing the Bisamik Dash. And it's only through this Mida, through Ava Shina, through Vahabdarecha Kumocha, through this Chesed, that the Shina can actually come and return and come back to us. So, how can we attain this lofty level? So, to answer this, we must understand what true Chesed is. And it's necessarily defined by the act. Two people can be doing the same thing, and one person can be doing Chesed, and one person can be doing a completely non-chesed oriented midah and that's depending on what their motives are and where it's coming from and the key to true chesed is the leaf as expressed by Nativ of Sharm below over here he says your more than any act that we're doing with our money or with our bodies it's not about the act itself but someone who reads us chesed his entire essence becomes one of chesed and he gives with all of himself it's not about the act itself the person who does chesed, who is a true chesed oriented person, feels for the person standing before him as if it's really him and gives to him with all of his heart. And that's like the most elevated level of chesed that, of course, is extremely hard to attain. And it's further expressed in Ali Shar, which talks about, and because of time, we're not going to go into it properly, but he talks about the concept of how believe is the one midah within us that is actually infinite and Torah is infinite. The Torah has to have a vessel that has an equal measurement to be able to fit it. And so sometimes we try to go through things intellectually, and there is intellect to it, and it's extremely important to try and understand the Kaddish Baruch with our intellect. But the intellect is finite. And the only area of us which is not finite, which is of infinite value, is our lead, is our ability to love people, to be able to help people, and to be able to go out of our way beyond intellect, beyond what strict justice dictates, to be able to help them. So it's one area of us that holds infinite value. And there's a really, really beautiful story. That's one of the last things I wanted to share before I hand it over. But there was a really beautiful story about Chanukh, and I'm going to read it inside. But it says that Chanukh, the Yitalei Chanukh, and Elohim, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, walked with Chanukh. And the Mepharshim try to explain what is it, what was it that Chanukh had that he was able to walk with HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And it says that he was a cobbler. And with each time that he would wash the shoes, he would be kind of making mystical unions with HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And someone asks, what are these mystical unions? What is it that HaKadosh Baruch Hu was doing? What was it that he was doing with HaKadosh Baruch Hu, these mystical unions? And Rabbi Sarah Salant, who was one of the big, most original Bali Maser, said that it can't be that he was not focusing on his work because that's not according to Halacha. He must have been focused on his work. So what are these mystical unions? And he says that the mystical unions which he attained were none other than the concentration which he invested on each stitch to ensure that it would be good and strong, providing maximum pleasure to the buyer. And this was his mystical union, something that's so close and so like normal to all of us. He was united and wholehearted in his desire and single-minded ambition to attach himself to be able to help people and to be able to use what he had to give to be able to ensure that the people around him were really benefiting. And that's a true display of Bab Derecha Komocha. So whilst it may be difficult to achieve, at the end of the day, there is a concept of, and it talks about it over here, and he says how the person that you give to you will turn to love. So it's true. We give to people that we love naturally. But at the same time, there's also a concept of you love the people, you come to love the people that you give. The only thing that differentiates a stranger from someone that we are close to is that active switch that we can choose to work on and can choose to override, to choose to give to people and cultivate a certain relationship with them that 
is more feeling like family and is more feeling like beyond what a stranger usually kind of feels like. So it is difficult to achieve, but at the same time, it is definitely a switch that is a two-way relationship. We give to the people we love and at the same time, we also are able to love the people that we give to and it causes a spiral. So at the end, there was a couple of things that I would have gone through, but again, because of the time, we're gonna hopefully skip through it. But essentially, just to summarize, when it comes to the principle of we say that that we should follow Nakash Baruch's ways, and the end of that Pasuk says, in order that it will be good for you. And the Farshim asks, why is it good for us to follow in Hashem's ways? Why is it good for us to do chas? Essentially, what the Mepharshim say is that when we focus our energies on giving to the world around us and bringing godly light into our surroundings, so too, there's an essence of midah kenegad midah, as you see in the, I'm just going to find it above, the Tehillim above, which says that, Hashem chesed ki ata the HaKadosh Baruch rewards each man according to his deeds. And so when we do chesed and we put out into the world chesed, going beyond what justice dictates, so too HaKadosh Baruch Hu goes out of his way to bring us godly light and to act with us directly from a midah of chesed. Meaning that even if by strict justice we're not deserving of salvation in X, Y, or Z, our initiation of chesed allows us to be saved through this very need of chesed from Hashem. And this is what we talk about when we say magin Avram in our field. So the Farshim say that the magin Avram, the shield of Avram, is actually the fact that he had chesed and he was able to initiate a level of chesed with people going beyond dictates. And therefore, HaKadosh Baruch Hu went out of his way to be able to create a shmir of Avram, but he was always safe and protected. So... I want to end off with this final quote, which I thought was really interesting, from Mechtam Eliyahu, written by Rav Desla, and he writes, These two powers of giving and taking form the roots of all character traits or actions. And note, there is no middle way. It is basic law that there is no middle path in human interest between the values of giving or taking. The heart of giving in her inheres only in the person who is happy, not just satisfied with his lot. We have already seen how the heart of one in a state of joy broadened to encompass all who are close to him. The more joyful the person the greatest desire that all his friends take part in his joy. And so it is with the giver, firmly rooted in the spiritual life. His eyes turn towards its heights. He sees everything, great and small, the loving kindness which are unending, and his mercies which have no limit. Consequently, his joy in these gifts know no bounds, and his life is unendingly happy. Out of this fullness of joy and happiness flow giving and love. Thus, the urge to do good to others, to make others happy, is not produced by a lack or deficiency. This is the spiritual level of the greatest tzaddikim who act to love. So to summarize, when we looked at the Evan Ezra before above, over here, we can see that it said that we should do and we should chase after HaKadosh Baruch Hu's ways. And that's why, the reason why the Pasuk and Ibn Ezra are saying this is because we should actually see every single opportunity of chesed as a chos, it's good for us to be able to do chesed because we are able to receive from HaKadosh Baruch a much closer relationship. And it's the entire way we were created is to, in order to build a relationship with HaKadosh Baruch and to be dovic to him and to emulate him. And so every opportunity to do chesed is an opportunity and we should chase after it. But what chesed means sometimes requires a certain mindset shift and it doesn't mean doing crazy acts or making the biggest gestures. We can sometimes just even like sending a short text to somebody or doing something very, very small or just smiling with a person. So when like, it doesn't cost anything. And as long as we are doing it according to our abilities as he stresses over here, not everyone has the same kohos and not everybody has the same ability to do chesed in the same way, but we each have a certain nakuda, a certain point that everybody is extremely powerful in. And if we can use that mida, which we're naturally overflowing with, naturally have, to be able to give to other people, we would be in a really, really incredible position. And this is what we see, that Hanukkah was able to attain the loftiest heights of chesed and, and the closest relationship with Hashem based off a simple, like his ability to be a cobbler, an amazing cobbler. And in that way, he was able to attain the loftiest heights that most people didn't attain. So to summarize, whilst instinctively we know that the role of chesed is to love a person as we love ourselves, we often have the found in this comparison. So chesed is not based on anything or external action, but rather it's a midah that is defined by an internal state and essence. And the definition of chesed is loving kindness for a reason. True chesed is giving from a place of contentedness and having what to give, not needing to fill a space. And it emanates from a place of wanting to expand our sphere of self, to envelop more and more people progressively. And we can achieve this from a place of life, from a place of heart, of loving other people. 
And as told, when we give more, we develop a love for others more and in a cycle and cultivate more chesed within our surrounding. And in doing so, creating this sense of ava schina, loving our fellows regardless of strict justice and overriding what justice dictates, as Rashi will be zocha to experience this strong vikas, this relationship with Hakadosh Baruch Hu, and be worthy of receiving from Him the midas hachesed, which creates the space for the shechina to rest amongst us. And as Rashi will be able in this way to actually be zocha to bring Mashiach from here of the as the final and everlasting midas hachesed. So, what I want to share. Thank you so so much. And yeah, if anyone has any questions, I think at the end. Yeah, we'll do questions at the end. Thank you so much, Michaela, for such a profound and meaningful analysis of Chesed. We move now to Tamara Ezekiel, who's speaking to us on acting humbly, covering the ego. Tamara went to Hasmian High School and then to Benos Avigal Sem. She's studying linguistics at UCL. So thank you, Tamara. Hand over to you now. Thanks so much. Hi. Um, and Michaela, thank you as well. Um, you've spent your whole year doing Chesed, so special to hear from someone who's so involved in it. Um, I'm also going to share my screen. Um, okay. So, if we were to play a word association game with the word sneers, I think we would come up with words like covering up, concealing, hiding. Um, anything along the lines of a dress code. But what we're going to learn um, together now um, will Emirates Hashem give us a bit of a different, a different angle, a different take. So let's look at the Gemara on the Pasuk that we're dealing with. So the Pasuk we're focusing on tonight is this Pasuk from Micha, which Hashem tells us the three big fundamentals that he expects all Jews to live by. And the one I'm focusing on is um, So the word that we're focusing on is so I'm not going to translate it because hopefully we're going to learn the translation together. So this sneya walks with Hashem. So we could translate it as humble, modest, anything like that, but we're going to discover a deeper meaning. So let's look at this Gemara and Sukkah, our first source. So walking um, in this humble way with Hashem, what does this mean? Okay, it's going to sound very strange, but this is the Gemara, okay? It is escorting someone who is deceased and escorting a bride to her wedding. Okay, sounds super strange so far. Um, and this is a Kalvachomer argument, which means that on the basis of one thing, we then draw something even stronger. I think it's called a fortiori in English. I think it's maybe the Latin or whatever. These things that we do so publicly, the Torah says, do these things humbly, these things that are so public, do those things quietly. The things that we do privately, how much more so does the Torah expect us to do those things quietly? Because the Torah is giving the example of something so big, like a wedding. Now they're not so big, but when they were so big, um, these kinds of events, how much more so are we going to keep private things private? So this Gemara is quite perplexing. Um, what on earth has a bride and attending a Leviah got to do with Tznias. Seemingly, it seems so disconnected, but we're hopefully going to tie it all together at the end. Okay, so I'm gonna move on to the next source. Um, what I love about this source is that it takes a Mishnah that I think we often use to mean something, something very classic, we can get to it soon. And this, this explanation from the Arve Nachal, which is a safer written by Rav David Shlomo Ibershitz, it totally flips it on its head, which I think is amazing. So there's a Mishnah in Pirkei Avos, Ethics of the Fathers, and it goes as follows. In a place where there are no men, strive to be a man. In other words, when you see a lack in society, go and fill it. For example, we could take last week's parasha, Pinchas, we see Pinchas as this person who he saw something going wrong. He saw Zimri and Cosby sinning. 
And he got up and he did something about it. He saw that there was a problem and he filled it. Um, I would say a more contemporary example, um, someone who I very much see as a role model and probably one of the reasons I'm able to share this Torah would be Sarah Shanira, right? She saw that there was a Haskala. She saw that there was an enlightenment and that Jewish girls weren't getting the education they needed, the Torah education. And she set up Beis Yaakov and she, she made people, she made us as women be able to actually sit and learn Torah and to be able to get the right chinuch, the right education so that we can build the right lives for ourselves and for future generations. So this is kind of how this mission is used. It's like, when there's no, when there's nothing going on and you need action, go out there and do it. And now we're gonna see it totally flip on its head. Okay, brace yourself. Okay, so I'm gonna come back to this line. Va'amar, she'yihiya ikar hishdad luso ba'avoda b'makom she'ein anashim. Okay, what does that mean? It doesn't, the Mishnah, in this explanation, it's not saying when there's no people taking action, take action. It's saying in a place where there are no people at all, meaning when you're in private, hishtada lihios ish, try and be an ish. Now, what's an ish? In Tanakh, the word ish is used to connote someone of importance, someone great. As the Arvi Nachal says here, Ki ish hainu gibar batura batzadik, right? They're, they're great in Torah and they're a righteous person. So what this Mishnah is saying is so different to the explanation that I've always learned. It's it's saying, b'makom she'ein anashim, when nobody is watching you, hishtada liyos ish, be your best self, which is totally contrary to the explanation we normally have, which is when everyone's watching and you're in public and a huge change needs to happen in the world, you go and fill it. This is saying when nobody's watching, you're going to fulfill, be your greatest self. To hide what you're doing as much as possible, that when you're in the confines of your house, when you're in the confines of your bedroom, you're being your greatest self when no one else is there. Okay, so now I'm going to take a pause and we're going to think about a medrash um so i learned this actually in sem um so i, I actually couldn't find the hebrew but i'm going to say it from i can think i can quote mrs schoomaker on this reliable source um so there are seven things this is from um voracious rubber there are seven things that a person will never know one of those things uh, just as an example is the yom hamisa the day that a person passes away and no one, a person doesn't know um, when that day will be, as an example. Now, another thing that a person doesn't know, it's very interesting. What is in the heart of his friend? Now, what that means is that we don't know what's going on in other people's heads, right? And, you know, sometimes we kind of walk into a room and we're like, do they approve of what I'm doing? Do they appreciate how long I spent buying this present? Do they acknowledge how great I've done in this job? We sometimes like look, we try to like figure out what people's thoughts are, but we never have total access to what people's thoughts are. Actually very interesting. Um, I was reading that on me last night um, and this author had written a fictional story about a lady who um, found this device, kind of like um, earphones, basically like AirPods. And when she put it in, she like attached it to a bracelet and she was able to hear the thoughts of those around her. And it was a nightmare. <laughs> like she would say to her husband, like, Oh, I can do the dishes tonight. And then she'd put in her earpiece and the earpiece would say, seriously, I've had such a bad day. I really don't want to do it. Ah, for shall I'm biased. Keep peace in the home. Okay, I'll do it. And then he'd say out loud, sure, honey, like, sure, I'll do the dishes. And she, she who has heard his thoughts was like, really? Do you actually want to do them? And he's like, of course, like I just said I would. And there was such like a, it's just very funny to read. There's such a gap between sometimes what people think and what people are actually saying. But the idea is, of course, that this device does not exist. And we don't have access to people's innermost thoughts. We don't really know what they think. And this basically leads us to constantly be hungry for people's validation. We're always kind of, it's a human drive. We're very, what um, Mrs. Schoomaker calls image conscious. We constantly feel like we're in front of an audience. Like as if like, is, is like, am I saying like the right things? Am I fitting in? Even see with little kids, um, you know, you'll walk into like a, a primary school and all the boys will go outside to break, let's say without coats. And I'll just think it's not cool to wear a coat. And you'll tell kids, like the mother will tell her son, you know, you really need to put on a coat when it's raining. But he won't put it on because none of his friends are, because he's already thinking, what are they going to think? Will they approve? 
So they're kind of hardwired to constantly be thinking, what does everyone else think? Okay. So with that kind of in mind, we're going to return to the Gemara. Okay. Let's go back to the wedding. So I'm going to go into the mindset of someone. Okay. Let's say this is a person. I walk into the wedding and I'm like, is my dress nice enough? I think I'm a bit too fancy. Oh no, the sister of the color, the sister of the bride, her dress is too similar to mine. I should have checked in advance. Then like, I'm like, oh, like what's the dinner going to be? Oh, I hope it's chicken. I really like chicken. And then we're dancing and I'm like, when's she going to pull me into the circle? I'm waiting for her to dance with me. Doesn't she realize I live in Manchester? Like, why isn't she pulling me into the circle? And we have all these thoughts going on in our head, like the whole way through the wedding. And it's totally me, me, me. It's like, does she realize I came to the wedding? Is she going to dance with me? And we've, we've got a lot going on inside. And in fact, the same thing can even happen at a, at a um, levi. We're going to be there for someone. And sometimes this thought can come into our heads of like, do they realize how much I've been there for them? You know, do they realize I had to take up a work to be here? And we kind of have a lot of thoughts of like me, like, does everyone realize that I came? Am I late? Am I too early? Am I overdressed? Am I underdressed? And we have all these thoughts going on. And there's nothing to do with what's going on around us. It's totally like a, a like our own world. And the way Mrs. Schoonmaker explains it is that Hashem deliberately created us image conscious. It's not, it's not, it's not a curse. It's, it's a reality. And we're supposed to use that to transcend. What do I mean? Like I said before, we have this, we're constantly feeling like we're performing for an audience like we're trying to impress someone like we're constantly trying to get someone's approval or someone's attention or someone's thank you or someone's appreciation and the reason for that is because Hashem hardwired us already to have God's consciousness that we're constantly in front of the audience in front of an audience of one which is him Hashem and in order for us to be God conscious he first has to create us image conscious so that we're aware that we're that we're constantly in front of someone while we take it to mean we're constantly in front of everyone else. We're constantly trying to keep up with everyone around us and thinking, is my dress too fancy or not fancy enough? And am I overdressed and underdressed? When really we're supposed to be focusing on one and that's Hashem. So the Sif Seichayim defines Sneas as the covering of the ego. Now, when we say covering, it sounds so negative. So I wanted to give a couple of examples. When we say Shema, we actually cover our eyes. And we don't see this as a negative at all. It's actually very beautiful. Because when we're saying Shema, what we're saying, Shema Yisra Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad. We're saying Hashem is one. I'm now declaring the most, basically the most important fundamental, except these three fundamentals, which we're now learning. Except for that, we're declaring this important fundamental that there's nothing in the world except Hashem. He is running everything. And if he took his finger off the button, so to speak, that kept us all alive, there would be nothing left in the universe. And we're tapping into that. And that concept is just so powerful. We just have to cover our eyes and just tap into that. Our physical vision is no way near enough to absorb that. So we cover our eyes. Another example of when we cover and we see it as something beautiful and powerful is by the Shabbos candles, right? Women cover, cover their eyes when they light Shabbos candles. And part of that, it's, a, it's, it's almost symbolic. It's saying the Kedusha of Shabbos, the holiness of Shabbos that I'm now ushering in. It's so... It's so um, it's just so pure and it's so holy that I'm not going to look at it straight with my eyes. I'm going to cover my eyes because I want my spiritual vision to first greet Shabbos before my physical vision. So covering is not a negative thing. Covering is actually saying what my physical, what my physical senses are going to pick up is just not enough. I want my spiritual to transcend. So when we say that sneers is about covering that voice, covering over kind of that voice inside our head saying, am I dressed? Am I, not? Am I not overdressed? Underdressed? We're not saying, oh, repress yourself. That's not the point at all. The point is we have such a powerful self inside of us, a self that's supposed to transcend and be God conscious. But because we get so distracted with these other secondary things, we want to cover it over so that we can allow our real self to come out because our real self is not the self saying, when's the bride going to dance with me? That's not our real self. It's just an extraneous thought that comes into our heads, but we just follow the wrong train track. And covering of the ego is supposed to lead us onto the right train track in order to allow us to maximize our relationship with Hashem. And what happens that we're, we're at a wedding and we do this sneers, right? Like the Gemara says, we do this sneers and we actually cover our ego. What it means is that I walk into the wedding and I say, Shavisi Hashem the Negdi Tamid. I place Hashem before me always. This is the reality that all Jews live with. 
that enables me to cover my ego because I'm not performing for anyone else. I'm performing for Hashem. One entity who's watching me, one God, he's watching me. Oh, what am I doing at the wedding? Oh, I came to be fulfill a mitzvah. Which mitzvah? Kala. I came to make the bride and groom happy. So the whole wedding, what am I focused on? Wow, the bride looks so happy. I'm so excited for her. She looks so beautiful. It's so fun dancing with her. Oh, I, ho I hope she's really enjoying it. Wow, she gets to dance with all her family. This is so much fun. That's what it's about. Oh, wow, she looks so beautiful in the pictures. It's about her. It's not about me because I walked in bef and I planned beforehand. Oh, my mindset. My mindset is to be Shvisi Hashem and Negdi Tamid, to be God conscious. Yes, to be image conscious because I naturally am as a human, but not of everyone else thinking, oh, she came late, she came early. When's she going to dance with me? But rather, I'm, I'm transcending that. I'm thinking I am performing for someone, for Hashem, and he wants me to be, make the bride happy. So that's my whole focus the whole night. And then when I dance, you won't even notice if she pulls you into the circle or not, because anyway, you'll be happy because you'll be so focused on the right thing. And that's why covering the ego, it, it, I can't even translate it in English. It doesn't even sound good. It sounds so negative, like we're squashing our inner self. No, we're bringing out our inner self. That's, that's the most real self we can get. The fake self is the one with all these, that all the silly thoughts that pop into our heads. And to come back to the Arve Nachal, right, we said, in the place where there, there are no people, that's where you should strive your hardest to be your best self. Where's the only place in the world where there are no people? Inside our heads. Inside our minds, we can achieve, achieve our greatest godless, our, our true greatness. Because inside my head, I can, I can be standing next to a friend at a wedding and I can be totally focused on the color, on the bride, and on how I'm so excited to, to be there for her as her friend and to dance with her. And the person standing next to me can be totally like what I said before with the dress and uh, my lady and uh, when she's going to pull me in. And we can both be exactly the same wedding, come the same time, leave the same time, but one of us will transcend and the other one didn't. And that's what Bahatsnei Alechas mean. And we end it, what? Im Elakecha, with Hashem. Because when I'm walking humbly, and I'm covering my ego, that's when I'm walking with Hashem. Because unless I cover over my ego, I'm not walking with Hashem, I'm walking with the whole world. I'm, I'm, I'm checking up if they think I'm funny and if they think I'm clever enough and if they think I'm whatever else it is, if I'm on, on time or dress nicely enough. But when I cover over my ego, I'm walking with Hashem because he's the only, he's the only being I want to walk with. He's the only being I, I want to be impressing. And um, I just want to end off um, with something very powerful I heard recently from he's called Rabbi Travis. I just think this is a really powerful way to end off. We started, not started, but we mentioned that um, this Pasuk, Shavisi Hashem. Oh, I have it here. I forgot about the source sheet. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, Shavisi Hashem, Lenegdi Samid. I place Hashem before me always. Okay, it's from Tehillim. And this is the mindset of someone who's Tsnias, because someone who is Tsnias is someone who is constantly tapped into this. They're covering over their own ego in order to allow the true self to shine, to be image conscious of Hashem, not of people. And the, the Shulchan Arach, the um, Arachayim section of Shulchan Arach, right, that's the first of the four parts, it begins with these words. This is the first thing a Jew is told. Like the first thing a Jew needs to know is to place Hashem before them always from the Ramah, Rav Moshe Isilis. That And then the, that same section, the Orachayim, ends with a comment of the Ramah who says, the Tov Lev Mishtetamid. He who has a cheerful heart always has a feast, which basically means if you're happy, your life is a party. Like if you're, if you're a person who always feels happy, everything's just super fun for you. Every, life is great. And it just seems like such a funny um, hussock for someone to put in a halakha sefer. I mean, if I would have read that in, in the English, I just translated it as, as someone who's happy is always having a party. I mean, what is that doing in a halakha sefer? People who are sitting there and learning this, they just need to get to the basics. The actual, I actually checked it up before, before the shit, it's talking about halakhas and adar, of whether or not people need to say tachanun, right? Because adar, we say it's the month of simcha. So yeah, it's about simcha, but people are reading the shulchan arach to get halakha. They're not reading it to hear about how to make life a party. But that's exactly what we're reading it for. That's exactly what we're learning these things for. Because when I walk into a wedding, whether I walk into my house, whether I walk into my job, whatever it is, if I am placing Hashem before me and I'm and I am covering over that ego of mine, and I am and I am transcending that image consciousness, 
I am living a party. That's exactly what it is. If you are Shavisi Hashem Lenegdi Samid, always, you are Tovrev Mishter Samid. The two Pesukim match perfectly. If you're always in a state of God consciousness, you are always living a party because you are always aware that you're in his presence and everywhere you go, you're, you're not thinking, what do they think? Do they approve? Do they appreciate? You're thinking, does he appreciate? Is he happy with me? Is he proud of me? And that's what true Sinias is. It's walking around and it's totally internal and nobody will know except yourself, right? No one's there in your head. You can let people in your head if you want, but you can push them away like uninvited guests if you wish to. And it's just about transcending, using that self-consciousness as God consciousness and living a true party with in the presence of Hashem. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed sharing. It's really close for me. So thank you. Oh, sorry, I think you're muted. Sorry, Susan. Sorry, I didn't realize I was muted. So thank you so much, Tamara. Such a powerful and meaningful exploration of walking humbly with Hashem. Next, we have Ayelet Besso Cowan speaking on justice, chesed, and modesty. Why these three? Ayelet went to MMY and then City University to study pediatric nursing. During that time, she worked as a youth director at Belmont and then in Israel and did some work for Tribe. She also worked for a year in pediatric cancer ward before starting a degree in medicine last September at Barts. So Ayala, thank you very much. I hand over to you. Hi, um, I have to apologize to everyone in advance. I think um, following a year of Zoom learning, my laptop has decided to fully conk out on the idea. Um, so I'm not able to share my source sheet, but I believe, thank you, um, Susan, um, for doing that. Um, so what I'm hoping to do um, in the next few minutes is just to kind of bring together um, some of the ideas that Michaela and Tamara have shared um, in the context of the Pasuk, um, which we have based the theme on. Um, and it's a Pasuk from Micha, um, which says, Higidlacha adab matov, mahashem darash mimcha. Um, so it's Micha telling the nation, he said, let me tell you what's, what's good and what Hashem wants from you. Ki masot chesed, to do justice, va'avat chesed, and to love goodness, and to walk modestly with your God. Um, and what I'd like to explore for a few minutes is kind of how does Micha choose three? We have 613 mitzvot. So how is it that all of a sudden we were able to just condense it down into three? Um, Susan, if you're able to scroll down to the next source, please. Um, so there's a Gemara in Makot, um, which discusses this idea. And um, there are three, well, there are a number of times in Tanakh where um, various leaders have come along and try to kind of compress the ideas of the Torah into a smaller number. Um, of things to focus on and the first one is um, David and in um, Tehillim number 15 um, he says um, who's going to um, live in the tent of Hashem and who's going to dwell um, on his holy um, mountain and then there's a full list of the sort of person that that would be. It's one who walks wholeheartedly, who is righteous, speaks truth in his heart. Um, he has no sl slander. He um, doesn't do anything evil towards his neighbor. Um, and the list continues. He neither gives his money with interest nor takes a bribe. Um, and it, the Gemara goes on to say that um, one who performs all of these 11 things will um, enter the world to come. And then later on um, in Tanakh, um, Yeshaya um, comes along and he compresses the ideas of the Torah into only six ideas. And his um, the chosen ones are one, um, he who walks righteously, speaks uprightly, um, despises the gains of oppressions, shakes his hand from holding of bribes. Um, he doesn't listen to bad things and he shuts his eyes from looking upon evil. Um, and we're just able to scroll down again. And then we come to Micha, um, and he's slightly later on in Jewish history. And he 
um, came and he took the 613 mitzvot and he shortened it down to the three that I mentioned in the Pasuk. Um, so if we continue down to the Rashi, which is source number five, um, Rashi explains that um, when David established the commandments as only 11, um, the reason why he did this was because um, in the beginning, we were righteous, um, and we were able to accept upon ourselves um, many commandments. Um, but later generations weren't so righteous, and if they were, um, a, if we would try to keep all of the mitzvot, then it would, it would be near impossible. And so David came along and um, established. 11 things that we had to reach um, in order that people would be able to attain the level required to reach Olam Haba. And then in later generations, Yeshayahu and then Micha and Habakkuk later on, although I haven't brought that source, um, also um, further and further made it simpler and simpler for everyone to reach the level required of them. Um, so I, what I want to do for a moment is just focus on the context um, in which Micha's operating and why he felt the need. Um, so the book of Micha is um, set in a time where there's lots of sinning. Um, the people of Israel have split into the two nations. There's the um, nation of Israel and um, and and um, he. Um, so the the book, the book of Micha kind of has four main themes. Um, at the beginning, um, Hashem sort of descends over the people and he delivers. Um, a load of curses because of how badly they um, they are behaving. Then later on, Micha condemns all the leaders and the prophets of the nation um, of Israel and of Yehuda, um, and he blames the leaders for the nation's corruption. Then, um, late, um, slightly later on, Micha goes into a lot of detail about what the days of Mashiach might look like. Um, uh, he gives some details of the process and the purpose of the process, and then. We come to this bit of um, Micha where he's sort of talking about redemption again, but of the process fr from the perspective of what's required of us to reach it. So um, if we just go to source six, which is the same as source one, but because I wasn't able to control it, I thought it'd be easier to just put it in again. Um, and just to look at the beginning of this chapter and um, what's going on. So it begins by saying, um, so Micha brings all the nation together um, before the mountains. And um, he says, and, ha and then Hashem says to the people, Ami ma lecha, uma heraticha anevi. My people, what have I done to you? What hardship have I caused you? Um, pl please tell me, and what's so hard about what I've asked of you? Um, and then Hashem reminds them of things he's done for them. I brought you up from Egypt. Um, I freed you from slavery. I gave you leaders, Moshe, Aaron, and Miriam. And then when Balak plotted against you and Balaam tr um, tried to um, curse you, um, you know, I, I um, saved you from that. And what do I want from you? Um, I don't want from you burnt offerings. Um, I don't want thousands of rams or streams of oil. Um, Rather, what I want from you is to do justice, goodness, and walk modestly, modestly with Hashem. So Hashem's telling us that it's not about the Beit HaMikdash. Um, it's not about kind of, um, it's not all focused on just um, bringing sacrifices. There's a lot more um, to it. So um, the Radak um, on this bit of um, Tanakh explains that um, um, Asop Mishpat is about the idea of Ben Adam um, um, to do justice is how we behave towards each other. Um, and then Avat Chesed, doing goodness, one would expect that that would be the one that he would consider to be Ben Adam between man and man. But he says that that is going above and beyond what's required of you. And then Vatsnea Lechet in Melokecha is between man and God. Um, and that's how he explains these three ideas. Um, but then the Maharsha, who is source number eight, unfortunately I wasn't able to find English for some of these, um, explains that 
with Yuri Dotodorot. So as the nations went on, um, generations went on, and they became less and less righteous, um, and there were and there were also more and more changing circumstances. There were more and more mitzvot which um, the people were not able to perform. Um, or they were limited to certain groups in certain situations. So, for example, the Kohanim and the Leviim served in the Beit Hamikdash. There are certain mitzvot that are only for women, certain mitzvot that can only be performed in the land of Israel. Um, but the mitzvot that David, um, Ishaya, and Micha chose were all mitzvot that everyone can aspire to achieve. Um, and much of um, Judaism is about kind of a good ethical sense. Um, it's about giving rules for life which um, are most reflexive and, um, and moral people would accept those things as things that we would strive to in order to be good people and to build a just society. Um, and a godly religion is not just um, for recognition of those kind of decent people around you, um, it requires living well despite what others may think of you. Um, and we don't need other reasons to be good people other than simply for the Shem Shemayim. And the idea of Vatsnei Alecha, which is um, what Tamara was explaining, was about being private about it. It's not about virtue signaling, which is something that um, is increasingly common nowadays on social media and other places where you have influencers who post about things that they feel passionate about in order that other people um following their ways but they do it to kind of show off you know i'm doing this thing and look at me and look at all these things i'm doing and you should be like me and um what this is this passage trying to teach us is we are expected to do you know lots of things hashem expects lots of things of us but do it privately do it because you want to do it not necessarily because you want everyone else to see you doing it you're not doing it to show to everyone else how good you are you're doing it for yourself um and then um, a different um, approach to this is the Maharal um, in Tiferet Israel, And he says that we're not removing mitzvot. All 613 mitzvot are still very important. But rather what we're doing is um, we are listing a number of uh, mitzvot that describe the way that a person should be. Um, and if Hashem's only asking these three things of us, then all of the other mitzvot of the Torah must come under these three brackets. So one might think that the reason we have mitzvot is to humble us. So a lot of the mitzvot would come under the bracket of v'hat sne'a lechet. Um, but actually, um, a closer um, examination would show that actually a lot of them come under the idea of chesed. Um, in fact, chasidim, um, or those that daven with nusach svad, um, I've got an excerpt of the Haggadah, um, is that when before doing a mitzvah, they say, Hineni Muchanim Zuman Lakayim Mitzvah. So here I am ready to perform a certain mitzvah. And then they say what the mitzvah is and why they're doing it. And then at the end, they say, Bashem Kol Yisrael, I'm doing this in the name of all of Israel. So they're not just performing the mitzvah for themselves, but it's an act of chesed for the whole of Israel. Um, and then um, in order to have a proper legal system we have laws that we don't always understand um so in modern day you know it could be driving at 50 instead of 70 or 70 instead of 60 whatever it is we don't necessarily know why exactly we're driving at those speeds but that's the law and we have a lot of chukim in torah that we don't necessarily understand why they're there um but in order to have a proper working legal system it's required of us um and there's um, a Gemara in Sutter that explains um, what the world will look like in the days of Mashiach. And one of the things that it, uh, it says um, that high costs will increase and um, there'll be lots of um, what, um, grape for fruit, but wine will be expensive. And then one of the other things that it says, which is what I'd like to focus on, is that um, it's right at the end of the sources that there'll be a lack of truth um, and there'll be a lot of sheker, a lot of lies in the world. Um, and sheker is the opposite of, of justice and um, the opposite of the way we're supposed to be. And I would say that in the generation that we live in at the moment, there's a huge amount of chutzpah in the world. Um, and there is in some places very little um, truth. And in some ways we are living in a world of sheker and it's one of the 
kind of biggest things that this current generation might have to address is looking at how do we um, live um, a just in a just correct way um, in this um, current generation. And what this Pasuk is teaching us is that to um, come close to Hashem, we have to focus on these three things. But from that, we build out actually most of the ideas of the Torah come under um, these things. Um, so one, I'm sorry, I'm just trying, because I, my laptop's broken, so my, I'm not able to access some of my notes. Um, so I'm just trying to, if you bear with me one moment, I apologize. Okay, I think um, I'm, I apologize this, but I'm gonna leave it there. I'm gonna open the floor to any questions just because um, I'm, I'm unable to access um, some of the things I wanted to say. Um, but I just wanna um, thank um, Tamara and Michaela also for speaking before me and also for Nair for inviting all of us to speak this evening. Um, I apologize for my abbreviated share, um, but my laptop has finally given up on me. Thank you so much, Ayelet. Really thoughtful share. And thanks to all three of you, Michaela, Tamara, and Ayelet, for sharing your wisdom and knowledge with us tonight and really inspiring us in, in such profound ways. We're very blessed in our community to have women of such talent. So thank you to all three of you. Um, next week, is the last share in our series. Dr. Haggit Blass will be speaking on the history, context, and meaning of the prayer for the state and the royal family. We can open up for questions if anyone wants to ask any of our three speakers any questions. It was a huge amount of information for us to absorb. I think you could have had the whole hour, each of you, we could have had a three hour session here. So um, for next week's year, if anyone wants to make a dedication for next week's year, let me know or Naomi Landy know. And I thank you all very much for joining us and to our speakers as well. You can see the thanks in the chat, which is great. All right, wish you all good night. And thank you again.